Good morning and good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. This time we're gonna do speed run because Raj needs to go somewhere very fast. Right, there. He's gotta go somewhere. <laughs> All right. Good morning. We've made it. You're sleeping, you're sleeping, a tunic. Right, man. Right. You ready to do some news? For a man, we got about 20 minutes, so let's get out of here. All oh, right. Time. For my right. first story, come back, kid. Boris Johnson chooses the frontal counterattack. Oh, Boris. I haven't got a two. <laughs> As I grab a story. New York City prepares for protests ahead of potential Trump indictment. Ooh. Manhunt in India. State of Punjab. 30 million people without internet. California weather as atmospheric river brings heavy rain and flooding, knocking out power. Oh yeah, they are still got that river. Concerns about exploitation of Ukrainian refugees in the Netherlands. And I'm going to just grab in sports. World, world best baseball classic crowns Japan, proves Miami can support game. Now Marlins must step up. And that's a Miami Airlines. Uh, Miami, Miami Marlins. Miami Marlins. <laughs> Hard to say. That's a Miami Marlins uh, headline. All right, your, your turn. No, well, that's it. All right. I'll say go. That and more on today's March. 22nd, 2023 edition of Before a Coffee. All right, let's All right. go ahead and go into my first story here. Come back for Boris Johnson. Hasta la vista, baby. With its usual witticism, Boris Johnson said goodbye to the House of Commons as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom last year, but the not-so-subtle message to his allies and fans was clear. Johnson was not giving up so easily. Like the Terminator, which Johnson quoted at the end of his farewell speech, he is eyeing return. I'll be back, he wanted to say. That open ambition may ah. come to an end this afternoon when Johnson has appeared before a parliamentary committee of inquiry. In a marathon series, the former Prime Minister has the opportunity to defend himself against the accusations that he deliberately misled Parliament about the illegal lockdown drinks in his official residence in the first year of the corona pandemic. Partygate, as the scandal came to be known, marked the beginning of the end for Johnson's premiership. When the first media reports of Downing Street drinks appeared at the end of 2021, Johnson tried to wiggle out of it like a Houdini. As usual, he played the truth. At first, he denied the parties had taken place. After new revelations, he acknowledged that although there had been drinks, the corona rules had been followed at all times. When more examples of illegal drinks surfaced, illegal drinks surfaced, Johnson played dumb. No one told me it was against the rules, he said in the House of Commons. Last year, civil servant Sue Gray issued We're a damning report on the debauchery in Downing Street. She spoke of leadership failures and concluded that these events should never have happened. Johnson was fined by the police for violating the corona rules. In typical Johnsonian fashion, the former Prime Minister has opted for a frontal counterattack. The committee would have no evidence that he deliberately misled Parliament. On Monday, he submitted a 52-page file of rebuttal and evidence. It would be appear that the government employees had assured him that time and time again that he had, violated, he had not violated any corona rules. The aggressive approach does not cite well with parts of Johnson's own party. Party leader Penny Mordaunt warned Camp Johnson not to undermine the committee's investigation. Prime Minister Sunak also said that this spokesperson that this is inappropriate to label the investigation a witch hunt. It indicates the significant part of the Conservative Party has had with the antics of its former leader. Johnson has always been said to be a cat with nine lives. 
a politician with an indestructible non-stick coating against even which scandals ricochet. But last year it turned out that even for Johnson, the laws of political gravity apply. The verdict of the Parliament Committee could be a well ground for him. Ooh. All right. Boris. Boris. <laughs> okay. Um, in uh, other guys with wild, held hair. Donald Trump may be indicted this week or next week. And here is an opinion piece. Actually, it's an opinion piece written by Ryan Goodman and Andrew Wiseman. Or Andrew Wiseman. History Party. Make no mistake, the investigation of Donald Trump and Stormy Daniels scheme is serious. Though it may be tempting to do, do so, it is a mistake. Who says the Manhattan District Attorney's investigation of Donald Trump by comparing his relative severity with those of myriad other crimes to be committed by him? That is not how the state and federal prosecutors will or should be thinking about the issue of charging Mr. Trump or, for that matter, any other defendant. Prosecutors are trained to consider whether the case can be brought. In other words, is there proof beyond a reasonable doubt to support a conviction? There also whether the case should should be brought. Principally, is the crime one that is typically charged by office in like circumstances? Put another way, is bringing the charge consistent with the rule of law that requires treating likes alike? Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan District Attorney, would be well within his discretion determining that the answer to these questions is yes and therefore supports charging Mr. Trump in connection with any crimes arising from the effort to keep Stormy Daniels from disclosing alleged affair to the electorate before 2016 election. This case is just one of a few ongoing criminal investigations into Mr. Trump's conduct, including potentially much larger financial investigation by the Manhattan District Attorney. The hush money scheme is no doubt the least serious of the crimes. It does not involve insurrection and undermining the peaceful transfer of power fundamentally for democracy, nor the retention of high, highly classified documents and the on the obstruction of national security investigation. But does that mean that the Manhattan criminal case is an example of selective prosecution? In other words, going after a political enemy for a crime when no one else has been charged with? Not by a long shot. To begin with, Mr. Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, who is an instrumental in the scheme, has already been pleaded guilty to the federal crime emanating from the conduct and served time for yet another crimes. Federal prosecutors sort of quote that Mr. Cohen acted in coordination with the direction of Mr. Trump, identified as individual one. It would be an anathema for the rule of law not to prosecute the principal for the crime when a lower level conspirator has also been prosecuted. Mr. Bragg, however, has had to pick up the slack since federal prosecutors had not pursued such charges for reasons that we are, that were clear under the corrupt influence of William Barr. R is reported to have shut down any follow-up investigations of Mr. Trump, but it remains murky as to why a criminal investigation or indictment of Mr. Trump has not been pursued under the current administration. A state prosecutor, Mr. Bragg, as a state prosecutor, Mr. Bragg cannot bring the same federal campaign finance charge to which Mr. Cohen pleaded plead guilty. He is, has various options on the list. The district attorney office has been charged with the crime of filing a false business record both as a felony and as a misdemeanor. The crime is a clear felony, done with the intent they to cover it to another crime, and otherwise is a misdemeanor. The charge focuses on the means that Mr. Trump and Mr. Cohen apparently devised to carry out the alleged scheme. Mr. Cohen would arrange the payments to Ms. Daniels, Mr. Trump would reimburse Mr. Cohen, and Mr. Cohen and Mr. Trump would cover up the true nature of the payments by recording the reimbursement as legal fees pursuant to the retainer agreement parentheses that the Justice Department said never existed. Because such fees would need to be reported by Mr. Cohen on his taxes, the Trump Organization paid Mr. Cohen substantial additional sums to pay these taxes. Similarly, to keep the Daniels payments secret, neither Mr. Trump nor his campaign would report the payments as a campaign contribution to Mr. Cohen. Okay. In short, if Ms. If it is Mr. Trump who is asking for special treatment. His former job does not and should not immunize him from accountability that would be sought for him. Seriously. Yeah, no one's above the law. That's what I say. 
Speaking of the law, in the Indian state of Punjab, a manhunt for a champion of statehood has far-reaching consequences for the sheiks. The police have shut down the internet, so that 30 million people can no longer go online. More than 110 followers of this Amritpal Singh have been arrested and weapons have been seized. Singh has his supporters carrying firearms and sword. The unrest began last month when hundreds of Singh's supporters formed a police station because of his associates were detained there. On Saturday, police stopped a convoy belonging to Singh, Singh and tried unsuccessfully to arrest him. The 30-year-old activist has been on the run ever since. According to the police, he has set up a militia, the logo of which has been found on the entrance of his house and on guns and bulletproof vests that have been confiscated. The hunt for Singh has had consequences abroad. Diplomatic posts of India have been attacked and defaced by Sikh activists in various places in the world. The reason for the authorities are so keen on the Sikh is historical. In the 1970s and 1980s, there was already a strong separatist movement in Punjab which fought for the independent state of Khalistan, led by Jarnal Singh Bedronwale. At the behest of the Prime Minister in Indra Gandhi, the army intervention with a heavy hand at Bindrawale was killed in June 1984 at the complex of Golden Temple in Amishtar, the Indura most important Gandhi. shrine for the Sikhs. He had taken refuge there and hoped that he would be left undisturbed. The bloody operation sparked outrage among, Se among Sikhs worldwide, and a few months later, Indra Gandhi was murdered in revenge by one of her bodyguards, who was a Sikh herself. In 1980s and 1990s, the Sikh struggle for independence in Punjab was a was crushed at the cost of some 3,000 deaths. The Indian government still looks at the state with suspicion and therefore taking firm action against activists such as Singh. In the background, there is a dissatisfaction among the large number of farmers in Punjab who have less and less income. Unemployment is high among young people. Singh has gathered gained a large following on social media and that seems to be the reason why internet is now not accessible in Punjab. This is how the police want to prevent Singh from mobilizing his followers. I think they should just let Punjab go. It's okay. India's a big country. Why not make it a little smaller? It's more manageable that way. I don't get it, man. If people want to leave your country, just let them. <laughs> I don't see the problem. <laughs> uh, and then weather news. Or <laughs> what left? A strong late season Pacific storm brought damaging winds and more rain. And snow to saturated California on Tuesday as the full, first full day of spring showed little change from the state's extraordinary weather. The storm focused most of its energy on the central and southern parts of the state, bringing threats of heavy runoff, mountain snowfall that forecaster says will be measured in feet. In the north, intense hail was reported in Sacramento, the state's capital. Trees and power lines reported down in the San Francisco Bay Area. An Amtrak commuter train carrying 55 passengers struck a downed tree and derailed near East Bay Village in Porta Costa. The train remained upright and nobody was injured. That's crazy. It stayed wow. upright okay. and nobody was injured after hitting a tree. One of those derailments you never hear about because nobody was injured. In the Bay Area, community of Porta Portola Valley, a man driving a sewer truck was killed when a tree fell into a vehicle, onto a vehicle. The California Highway Patrol said in Monterey Bay region, a severe winds, windstorm located a ocean, over the ocean blast in Santa Cruz County with high wind gusts up to 80 miles per hour at midday. Along the coastline of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, ocean foam below across the road rays look like large snowflakes. Ocean foam turning into ice. Wow. So that seems beautiful. I want a picture of it. Winds gust 60 miles per hour, 76 miles per hour, sorry, in Santa Cruz Mountain Community, including Border Creek. Resident Frank Kerr waited for hours till this afternoon in downtown supermarket for Bruce to remove his large redwoods that were blocking the highway. Trees are down everywhere. The wind was unbelievable. Branches were flying through the air. The folks could hear trees just falling and cracking. This one's a doozy, Kerr said. Story. All right. In local news, we're looking at concerns about Ukrainian refugees in the Netherlands. Work more than 10 hours a day for less than minimum wage, being fired after a month, and then also being put on the street without a salary. It happened to a middle-aged Ukrainian man who fled the war in April and has been living and working in the Netherlands ever since. He reported a fair work, just like 12 
212 other Ukrainians have done since Russia invasion. The organization received all kinds of questions and complaints, from people who were not paid their salary, to people who had to pay an intermediate, intermediary for a citizen service number, or forced to register with the Com Chamber of Commerce. 69 Ukrainians were also at risk of human trafficking. By the way of comparison, in 2021, this case was 5 Ukrainians. Often it goes like the example above. The Ukrainian man found an employer who also spoke Russian through an advertisement, which was useful. He went to work in construction. He had no contract. The employer would arrange after a month. He promised salary was 12 euros an hour. Sometimes employees are required, already recruited in Ukraine through advertisements on Facebook, says fair work spokesman Francine Winsimaus. Muse? Yaus? People then have to pay a certain amount to an in intermediary who arranges work. In addition, the more clients have paid for mediation, the more wages per hour are promised. The Ukrainian house shows that them the way to authorities and place to sleep, and if necessary, gives them food and package. Most people don't come here until they have nothing left, says Savchuk. She estimates that the number of complaints registered by Fair Work is just the tip of the iceberg because she feels that many Ukrainians don't dare to talk. Henry Stroke of the Combating Abuse Broadcasting Constructions Team at the CNV Trade Union recognizes this image. He points to the Polish employment agency John Pohl, which used strangling contracts with fines of 20% of the total salary that employees had to pay if they delivered work that was not satisfactory. Employees in contracts who were also threatened with deportation to Poland or Ukraine if they did not comply with the rules. The judge recently ruled in favor of CNV in defamation case that John Pohl had started against the union. The Polish employment agency did not want the union to use the terms exploitation or strangling contracts for John Pohl's working method. The employment agency said it adhered to the rules. The judge found that CNV was allowed to use those terms and based this party on this partly on contracts from Jan Pohl, which states that employees are not allowed to have contract with Dutch employers. The judge also took into account that a number of Ukrainians stated that CNV, the CNV, that their salaries were withheld for accommodation and transport, that they had no money to buy food, that they could not access the bank account open for them, that they could not return to Poland when they wanted to, because Jan Pohl determined when they returned the journey would take place. According to the stroke, a salary to these employees was initially paid, but the allowances for expenses were immediately deducted. This was possible because the employer worked with a kind of and and or account, in which the employer was the joint account holder. The Dutch Labour Inspectorate does not want to say anything about the investigation that is now underway into the company. Earlier, Minister Van Geniep, Social Affairs and Employment, called strangling contracts for Ukrainian employees, among others, unworthy of the Netherlands. Fair Work is also, also says it's very concerned and insists on good information and support option for these people. They are on the run. The purpose of the rifle was not work, and these people will have not prepared for that, says spokesman Wincy Moose. In addition, some will suffer from trauma, which puts them in an extra vulnerable position. I mean, right on. <laughs> Get them! Uh, Dutch on. Labor Inspectorate! Uh, Find them! Humanitarian crisis to sports! <laughs> and a, one of the weirdest the head, I just gotta read this headline Japan's Otani strikes out Trout to seal World Baseball Classic win to seal. yes he, he struck out a fish that's really hard he to do he stuck out and a it, trout that, and then to seal it right so <laughs> <laughs> and they all had sushi yeah okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this is Mark 21st Reuters. Shoai Atani struck out Mike Trout in a showdown between two of the game's best players, and they're both actually on the same team in, in Major League Baseball. They're both California Angels. Uh, I'm sorry, Los Angeles Angels. Two of the game's best players to seal Japan's 3-2 victory over the United States in a riveting World Baseball Classic Finals in Miami's Lone Depot Park on Tuesday. Baseball is United States national time, national, national pastime, but Japan's win over the defending WBC champions means that they have won three of five editions of the Global Showcase. They were perfect 7-0 through this year's edition. The contest ended in a duel that is likely to go down in baseball folklore as Otani, the hitting and pitching sensation from Japan, forced faced off against his Los Angeles Angels teammate and U.S. captain Trout. Whether I get him out or get get get, or or he got a hit off me, I didn't want to make any great regrets. I did not 
sorry, not want to have many regrets. I wanted to make my best pitch. This is a different experience representing your country and facing guys representing their country. It was different intensity. It was great. And it was great. Carrying the nation's flags, the two men led their respective teams onto the field and then at the climax, in a moment of pure sporting magic, stood across from each other with, with everything on the line. With Japan clinging to a 3 to ninth inning lead, they turned to their ace Otani. He walked to the first batter he faced in Jeff McNeil, but then he got Mookie Betts to hit a double play, bringing up Trout with two out in the sellout crowd on its feet. Throw 100 mile, throwing 100 mile an hour fastballs, Otani struck out his Angels teammate on six pitches, trigger celebrations as the Japan team poured out of the dugout. Otani the unicorn. Japan manager Hideki Hirayama said the win could have been a big could have a big impact on the sports popularity back home. All the kids in Japan who are watching might think, oh that's really cool. And they might want to make up their mind to want to be baseball players. US manager Mark Delarosa said that it had been a storybook ending in the baseball world, but it had hoped. But it hoped it would end a little bit different with Mike popping one. <laughs> whole world got to see Otani come in. Big spot battling. It's kind of how he was made to be scripted. It also he praised Otani saying no moment's too big for him. What he's doing in the game is probably 90% of the guys in the clubhouse did a little league and youth tournaments. And he's able to put it all in the biggest stages. He's a unicorn of the sport. Otani was named the WBC's most valuable player after posting the best statistics over the entire tournament. Nice. All right, man. All right, let's and quickly, I'll just quickly cover my media news in two okay. sentences. Bruce Springsteen receives highest award from President Biden in... It was the first time in the presidency that Biden handed out the accolade for National Medal of Arts at the White House. Springsteen 73 was held at the ceremony as one of America's greatest artists and storytellers. Uh, cool. Springsteen is one of the most successful American artists of all time. He sold about 140 million albums worldwide, received several Grammys and Golden Globes, and also won an Oscar in 1994 for the title song of the film Philadelphia. Born in the USA from 1984, his far best-selling album in Springsteen's catalog, the title song was an indictment of the Vietnam War, among other things, but was misinterpreted by the then President Reagan as a patriotic song. And there we go, quick uh, media news there. Bruce. Okay, that's what his, his, fans, his fans say when it sounds like boom. Okay, this day in history, Reese Witherspoon was born at this day in 1976. Happy birthday, Reese Witherspoon. In this day in 1765, the British Parliament passed the Stamp Act, which led to our famous Boston Tea Party. Also, birthday is 1948, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Uh -huh. 1947, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Phantom of the Opera. Right. James Patterson, author, 1947, was born this day. Canadian actor, James T. Kirk. William Shatner was born on this day in 1931. So he's 92. Damn. Happy 92, Willie. Stephen Sondheim, American composer, was born on this day in 1930. On this day, Robert Mueller in 1920, uh, what year? 2019, Robert Mueller delivered his report on Russian interference, which was buried by William Barr and changed in bastardized before it was released. How convenient. In 1972, U.S. Senate approved the Equal Rights Amendment, which but failed ratification by 38 states before the deadline. And that's today in the news. All right, and that and has been... that will do it for us today. That's been Allison rushing through the news because Raj has to go somewhere. Hope to see you Roger next time for another exciting news day, and we'll see you tomorrow on Thursday. Roger will hit the news and go work hard for a bunch of ungrateful slobs. <laughs> so go ahead. Ridicule me. I'm at least making some money at it. I don't fucking know. <laughs> and have a nice day at March 22nd, 2023 on Before Coffee. Goodbye. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons. And follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records.